What about carbohydrates and, and fiber? So we talked about carbohydrates and the majority of the way that we're talking about carbohydrates is really not within a fiber matrix. We're talking about, you had mentioned that it's kind of the worst thing that if someone wanted to just completely blow themselves up from a health and metabolic perspective, they would eat a high carbohydrate, low protein diet. Fair? Fair to say that? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I, I think that we're beginning to get sensitive to the concept of refined carbohydrates, but a lot of people say, well, that's sugar. But actually, bread is probably more of a risk than table sugar because it's pure glucose. And that has a bigger effect on, on blood insulin. Thank you to Divi for sponsoring this episode of the Dr. Gabrielle Lyon Show. Did you know that hair loss affects over 80 million Americans? Individuals really struggle with hair loss and it deeply affects how they feel about themselves. This is one reason why I love Divi. It is a scalp serum product that improves the appearance of breakage. It nourishes hair follicles and removes product buildup, which is amazing. A few key ingredients. It has a copper tripeptide, caffeine, tea tree oil, amino acids. All of this helps with overall hair health, hyaluronic acid, which nourishes and hydrates. And by the way, a bunch of this stuff I even put on my face. Not the Divi, but in a separate product. Divi is not just for those experiencing hair loss, but if you want to maintain your healthy hair. If you want to take back control of your hair and scalp health and do it with clean, science-backed ingredients, well, we have a special offer for my listeners, and that is go to divyofficial.com slash Dr. Lion or enter Dr. Lion at checkout for 20% off your first order. That's use divyofficial.com slash Dr. Lion for 20% off your first order. Hi, friends. Welcome to the Dr. Gabrielle Lyon Show. And I'm very excited to have my best friend and mentor of two decades, Dr. Donald Lehman, Professor Emeritus from the University of Illinois, a world-leading expert in protein metabolism. And again, if you've been following me for any length of time, then you know Don Lehman. And in this episode of the Dr. Gabrielle Lyon Show, we're going to shift up the conversation a little bit. We are going to talk about muscle-centric health, but we are also going to spread our wings and move beyond the primary focus of protein. We're going to talk about how to create a balanced diet. We're going to discuss some of Don's earlier studies as how he thought about protein, carbohydrates, and fats, and really balancing a nutritional plan for the individual. We're going to take a deep dive into cardiometabolic health and how that actually relates to skeletal muscle health and so much more. Don, welcome to the show. It's great to be back. You've been out on a world tour with your new book. I'm excited for you. It's good to see you again. <laughs> for those of you guys who do not know, I recently released my book with Atria, called Forever Strong, and it is dedicated to Dr. Donald Lehman. No pressure there, buddy. <laughs> but um, the book is really meant to change the conversation, and the world is ready for it. So I'm so grateful that you guys are taking a moment to listen and be on board with this mission and message, because this mission and message does not exist alone. We need you to go out there and spread the message. Yeah, it's uh, it's exciting. I think we're the message is important. I think people kind of inherently know the importance of muscle and protein and exercise, but I think a lot of times the lay public needs to be reassured. They kind of need to have the permission to go ahead and do what's right. Uh, and so I think it's a I think it's a great contribution. Today, I wanted to talk a little bit about not just the macronutrient protein, but some of the thoughts behind how we can add in or take away, just how we think about carbohydrates and fats, the other macronutrients that have really paled in comparison with our discussion to protein. Yeah, we've been a bit protein centric, but you know, I think everybody needs to recognize that 
a diet is made up of all three macronutrients, and we're always going to want to talk about balance. And when we talk about muscle-centric health, uh, we need to think about how the muscle uses fuels. How does it prioritize things and, and that balance? So I think it's, a, it's an important conversation to have. Well, bringing us full force forward, how does the body prioritize macronutrients? What dominates metabolism? You know, we've heard so many negative things about fat, but I think one of the things people need to begin with is muscle's priority for metabolism for energy is actually fat. That's its first choice. And so until you get muscle working at really high levels uh, above, say, 65% of your maximum capacity, the priority is always for using fat. And so I think that's important. Uh, again, we have to always balance calories, but uh, fat is always the first priority for a fuel for muscle. And is that fat from the diet or is that just free fatty acids that are being utilized in flux? Where, where is that coming from? The muscle really doesn't care. Those fats aren't really labeled as this one's from the diet and this one's from storage. So uh, the body the body always maintains a certain level of free fatty acids in the blood. And after a meal, a lot of that can be coming from what you just ate. But during in between meals, it's coming out of adipose tissue. So the, the body maintains an excess of free fatty acids in the blood all the time so that it fuels... And one of the muscles is, you know, is is the heart. Another one is the diaphragm. These muscles all use uh, fatty acids continuously, and muscle is another one of those. And if someone were to have a mixed meal, and they are not exercising, they are sedentary, they have a mixed meal of, we'll just say, 50 grams of glucose and a handful of fat and dietary protein, how can we begin to think about um, what dominates metabolism in that kind of picture? I think everybody needs to recognize that uh, glucose is an important fuel. It's essential for the brain, red blood cells, but it's also a risky fuel. Uh, it's the origins of diabetes. If you have too much in the blood, then you get di you know, you're diabetic and you get all of the problems with it. So that's a really critical balance. Um, you sort of made the question more complicated by f picking 50 grams. Uh, you know, I did that. Wait, by the way, I did that on purpose. So what <laughs> you guys don't know is Don and I talk frequently as in every day and we chat about this. But the goal is, is that we make our conversations public for you guys. I, so, I picked that number on purpose. Yeah. So, so I'm going to bracket your 50 first and just say that the average American's eating almost 300 grams of carbohydrate. So that means they're getting, let's say, three meals, ignoring snacks. They're getting 75 to 100 grams of glucose at a meal. Um, what we know is the body... If it's only using glucose for a fuel, it can burn maybe 20 grams per hour. And we know that one of the definitions of diabetes is blood glucose stays high longer than two hours after a meal, 20 grams. So 40 grams kind of is an important threshold. So you pick just over it. So now we're a little bit in excess. And the question is, where is it going to go? People will say, well, we store it in glycogen, but that might be true after an overnight fast. But how about the person who wakes up and has a hundred grams of carbohydrate for breakfast, uh, sits in front of a computer all morning, and then has another 50 grams at lunch? Where is it going to go? The only way it, you know, we handle it is you shut down all fat metabolism in the body. And that extra 10 grams have to actually get made into fat for storage. And so that's sort of a threshold. You know, how much carbohydrate can you use per hour? Um, again, if you shut down all other metabolism, you can use about 20 grams per hour. Uh, and then you have to basically store it in some form. And so that's the threshold. Uh, the body would rather store fat than to convert glucose into fat. And why is that? Just from an energy expense standpoint? 
the body does it, you know, if, if you're storing fat, it's coming in at fat and you can directly store it. If it's coming in as glucose, basically you have to make it into fat either in the liver or in adipose tissue. And as you begin to make it into fat in the liver, you begin to get some of the cardiometabolic problems. You get higher triglycerides, uh, you, you, know, you see f f increased free fatty acids in the blood, uh, you get fatty liver, you get all of the beginning indications of insulin resistance and what we might refer to as metabolic syndrome. Yeah, I love that. We will be publishing a paper, hopefully this year, uh, discussing those very things. And uh, cardiometabolic disorders, again, express a cluster of metabolic and physiological risk factors, including just what Don had mentioned, elevated body fat, abnormal blood triglycerides, insulin resistance. Um, and this is originally termed syndrome X or metabolic syndrome. When you're talking about, or when we're discussing carbohydrate loads, 50 grams or higher, which seems to stress the system at rest, not in activity, so we're talking about a sedentary state, I suppose the next question would be, how long would someone be able to continue to do this? Is this a, um, you know, if this is a daily thing over time is probably when we get to see some aberrant markers versus once a week or once every few weeks. Have you thought much about the time frame in which this really impacts a person? I think you're exactly right that uh, the longer you expose the body uh, to this excess carbohydrate, the more you begin to stress it, the insulin sensitivity, et cetera. Uh, we actually did some experiments like that in animals uh, where we Def, we showed that, that the longer you feed an excess carbohydrate diet, the more likely you're going to create insulin insensitivity. And, you know, people get confused about, you know, what causes insulin uh, resistance, in, insulin insensitivity. And there are experiments out there there that you can use really high fat diets to cause it. Uh, but we need to think about, you can really cause it with high carbohydrate diets. And so then you need to step back and say, well, what's the American diet full of, you know, is it full of fats? Is it full of carbs? And if you look at the data, basically Americans are eating about 50% of their energy from carbohydrates, particularly refined carbohydrates, and about 35% from fat. So are you going to say it's the 50% or the 35% that are causing the biggest problems? Uh, we did a lot of experiments, uh, three major clinical experiments looking at replacing the carbs with protein. And what we showed is we can dramatically change glycemic regulation, lower uh, percent body fat, lower triglycerides in the, uh, in the blood, lower blood pressure. Uh, so we know that reducing the carbohydrate fraction is very effective. Which is a little bit interesting because in the literature, or I think that there's really two groups, there's the calories in, calories out camp, and then there's the carbohydrate insulin model camp. And what I'm hearing you say is it's probably somewhere in the middle. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, the, the calories in calorie out sort of camp is sort of looking at body composition as opposed to glycemic regulation. Um, what we showed in our studies is that, and we had two groups, we had one that was following the food guide pyramid, which was basically a high carb, low protein diet another that was following a higher protein, lower carb diet. Uh, and what we showed is that in the food guide pyramid, as they lost weight over a month or two months, they would slowly improve some of those markers. So body fat has an effect, but what we showed with the reducing carbohydrate is we could correct the metabolic problems in two weeks. So it's not purely a calorie issue. It's not purely a weight or body fat. It's a metabolic issue. So both outcomes will affect it, but you'll affect it far quicker by lowering the carbohydrate component. That's fascinating. This idea that one is affecting the metabolic outcome quicker versus a 
body composition change. When you were looking at these two groups, um, I'm assuming, was this a 2005 paper? Do you remember? No, there was one in 2003, 2005, and I think the last one maybe 2007 or eight. Okay. There were three and, of them. Yes, and because I have one pulled up, no surprise. There was one paper that I, I do think is important to mention, and this this paper was a 2005 paper, and it looked at the additive effect of exercise and dietary protein. And basically, the low protein group, which not surprisingly was the RDA of dietary protein at 0.8 grams per kilogram. Um, and, and, and also then, the food guy pyramid. We did it exactly the way people would map it out. Which is... I think important because while we don't discuss the food by guide pyramid anymore and we've moved to my plate, I would argue that the food guide pyramid is still representative of what we're putting on our plate right now because yeah. we're eating 50% of our diet is in carbohydrates. And, and it comes very heavily from grains. I mean, grains were the foundation of the food guide pyramid, and that still remains the foundation of our carbohydrate intake. I mean, I don't think any nutritionist would argue that people wouldn't be healthier if we ate more broccoli and green beans, but Americans are eating wheat bread. Yeah. Still, and you know, I do want to circle back where we got the recommendation of carbohydrates because the RDA is really closer to a maximum on carbohydrates versus, again, sedentary people versus the protein recommendation is a minimum. I think the majority of people, even nutritionists, don't even realize we have an RDA for carbohydrates. The RB RDA for carbohydrates is 130 grams per day, which sort of is designed around the brain and red blood cell and kidney needs for, for glucose. But the average American is really close to 300 grams per day, so almost three times the RDA, where with protein, uh, the RDA is 0.8. Americans are eating about 0.9 grams per kg, so we're just barely above the minimum for a, for a deficiency. So we have very different attitudes about those two RDAs. In one case, we ignore it. In the other case, we think it's a threatening issue. Do you have a, um, a sense as to why that is? Um, you know, I think that it's embedded in a lot of things, uh, dating back to the fear of cholesterol and the fear of saturated fat. We drove the diet based on guesses about fat. You know, where did the 30% fat concept come from? Well, that's a pure guess. Where did the 10% uh, saturated fat come from? Well, that's a pure guess. There's no data to back that up. Um, and so, you know, if you start it from a fat content, then you say, well, grains are cheap. We'll, we'll bring in, you know, you should have a lot of carbohydrates and protein's not very important. And so that's how they really constructed the diet. And, you know, as, as you and I try to make people understand, you need to start your diet with your protein decision. If you make a higher protein decision, that's one decision. If you make a lower protein, that's another. But once you make that decision, everything else about the diet has to start balance it. And everything about your lifestyle, your exercise, things related to your age all come into play. So once you make a protein decision, everything else has to follow it. And would you say that that's the most important decision? I think a it is. You know, I, I mean... I think you and I would agree that exercise is right up there, but you know, if if you're not willing to do the exercise you and I do, then protein's the most important of the diet decisions. Yeah, and just to point out again from this this paper, and you guys, we will link this paper. Um, maybe I'll even put a, a pop up here. But one of the highlights of it was that it, so it had the low protein group, and then it had what you call a high protein group, which was double the RDA at 1.6 grams per kg, which I would argue and say is not high protein. I would say that that's more optimal semantics. I have, I have tried to slowly stop using the term high and call it higher. Uh, I think that, you know, if you look at dietary reference intakes for every nutrient, there's a range. Uh, and I don't think high really comes into play until you get up to around 2.5 grams per kg. I think above that is high. Uh, so we have a range from 0.8 
to 2.5 at least. So 1.6 is kind of right in the middle. Um, I would absolutely agree with you. And looking at the data here, because I'm, I'm actually looking at it, and basically this study, this was a, a pretty long study, if I am if I am getting the right one. That, that study here. was uh, four months, 16 weeks. Okay, so 16 we weeks. We did a 12-month study, but that specific one was uh, four months. And the one of the things that was so interesting is that the exercise that this group did was not intensive at all. Um, yeah. Do you want one to of the things we that? wanted to do uh, is sort of pull it out of the uh, you know the bodybuilder category. I mean, this was a study done with uh, midlife women who tend not to like to go to gyms and lift a lot of weights. And so, what we set up was we had them do uh, supervised uh, five days a week. They had 30 minutes of walking and two days a week, they had a 30 minute uh, session of yoga and, and using Nautilus machines. Uh, but basically we didn't require them to put weights on them. They could do whatever they wanted. And so it was really more about stretch. Uh, stretch is one of the main parts of the resistance exercise. People will say, well, gee, how, how much did I lift? Uh, People forget that the you know the eccentric motion as you stretch back out is almost or maybe as more important as the concentric, and so this was really about stretch, um, and what we found was in part an additive effect in both groups whether you had a low protein or higher protein the exercise made a difference you lost they lost more body fat and tended to spare uh, lean tissue they didn't lose as much muscle mass. But I think one of the fun conclusions is these groups were supervised for 16 weeks of daily exercise. And in the low protein group, they lost a total of 0.5 kg. So about one pound more of fat with 16 weeks of exercise, where in the higher protein group, exactly the same exercise, they lost 6 kg. So almost... 14 pounds more body fat doing 100% the same exercise. So you can either say that the protein made the exercise more effective or the low protein diet made it less effective, depending on which you want. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. Do you have any thought as to, as to which side of the coin that falls upon? Yeah. You know, I'm not really sure. You know, I, I think that I think that the as we were talking before the macronutrient balance having high carb low protein is probably the worst case scenario in terms of a diet health. Uh, I think it probably minimizes the effect of exercise, uh, increasing the protein, reducing the the high glycemic carbohydrates. Uh, I think is a beneficial approach to exercise. So I think it protects the muscle. So again, I sort of skirted your question. I know. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure which is most important, but the data was 100% clear. What I think is really fascinating, and I'm sure you guys have picked this up, um, I have a lot of researchers on the podcast. And the way a researcher will answer a question typically is framed very specifically. Um, and I, I think that that goes to the integrity of how a researcher thinks and really their scientific integrity of asking and answering questions. I just want to point that out because we did have also Dr. Chris McGlory on, um, and he answered questions very similarly, as well as Emily Lance and many of these other researchers. Uh, and when it's their opinion, they will certainly say, well, this is my opinion, but really this is what the data will show. When it comes to protein, weight loss, and muscle mass, why is it that when an individual shifts away from a higher carbohydrate diet, and is it fair to say anything above 100, and how do we define a higher carbohydrate diet, just so that we have a vocabulary that is consistent? Thank you to Cozy Earth for sponsoring this episode of the show. You've heard me talk about Cozy Earth, whether it is in the form of sheets, towels, robes, loungewear. Once you get in Cozy Earth, you are not going to get out because people are going to wonder why you are showing up to meetings wearing your Cozy Earth PJs. 
Cozy Earth is amazing, soft, breathable products. They even have temperature regulating sheets. I love them. And if you don't like them, Cozy Earth will refund your purchase plus shipping, no questions asked. That's how much they stand behind their products. It is made from viscous from bamboo, so it traps less heat, enabling people to sleep, move comfortably. You don't feel so hot. And for a limited time only, you can save up to 40% on Cozy Earth. Go to CozyEarth.com slash Dr. Lion and enter my promo code Dr. Lion at checkout to save, that's right, up to 40% now. And by the way, if you want to try the sheets, you can try them for 100 nights. If you don't sleep cooler, you can send them back for a full refund. That's CozyEarth.com slash Dr. Lion. The... The way we've tried to frame that is that we have this basic need for carbohydrates, as I've said before, for the brain, red blood cell, and the kidney. And you can say that ends up being around 100 grams per day. And the way we frame it is then your use of carbohydrates relates to your muscle activity. And that range is about 40 to 70 grams per hour, depending on the intensity of exercise. So we usually give people credit and say that for every gram of carbohydrate uh, above the RDA, 130, you have to account for it with exercise. And it's around, you know, rule of thumb, around 60 grams per hour of exercise. So for the average American with 300 grams of carbs per day, they have to be doing three hours of fairly intense exercise per day. And very few Americans are doing any exercise, let alone three hours. So we've got this disconnect between our carbohydrate intake, which as we were saying earlier, that is a threat to insulin sensitivity. Uh, Insulin, everybody, you know, taught in your first class in nutrition and biochemistry and even med school is is that insulin is a regulator of blood glucose. And I don't think that's true at all. I think insulin is a safeguard. It's an insurance policy against excess blood glucose. And if you continuously day after day, meal after meal, threaten that insurance policy, essentially it burns out. And that's exactly what diabetes is, is basically type 2 diabetes is insulin failing to be effective enough to maintain your blood sugar. And on a side note, one way to utilize blood sugar or blood glucose, glucose in general, without the use of insulin would be exercise. Exactly. Exercise improves the ability to utilize, again, glucose without the requirement of insulin. And, mu- and uh, muscle has, to, to that point, muscle has two glucose transporters, one of which is insulin sensitive and one of which isn't. And at baseline levels uh, of low carbohydrate intake, a lot of the glucose that gets into muscle gets in with a non-insulin dependent transporter. Which is, is fascinating to understand. What about carbohydrates and, and fiber? So we talked about carbohydrates and the majority of the way that we're talking about carbohydrates is really not within a fiber matrix. We're talking about, you had mentioned that it's kind of the worst thing that if someone wanted to just completely blow themselves up from a health and metabolic perspective, they would eat a high carbohydrate, low protein diet. Fair, fair to say that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I think that we're beginning to get sensitive to the concept of refined carbohydrates, but a lot of people say, well, that's sugar. But actually, bread is probably more of a risk than table sugar, because it's pure glucose. And that has a bigger effect on, on blood insulin. So, you know, I think I think we have to think about that. I'm sorry, I sort of lost the train of thought there. What was your question? My, so the, the question is, you know, we were talking about carbohydrates and really in this, car, this carbohydrate-centric way of eating, which really has been happening since it's been ingrained in the U.S. Dietary Guidelines. Yeah. For over 50 years, again, the average American is eating 300 grams of carbohydrates. 
you said um, a statement that I think is important and a statement that we should clarify and take another layer <laughs> approach to. And the statement was, the worst thing someone could do would be to eat a high carbohydrate diet with low protein. Excuse yeah. me. And then <clears throat> my follow-up statement was, well, where does fiber play in, into a role here? And what kind of carbohydrates are we really talking about? Right. So fiber is actually sort of a unknown at this point. Um, we have these you know, insoluble, soluble fiber things that aren't actually very measurable. Uh, I was at a meeting just a few weeks ago, and one of the big discussions is, is what's the future of fiber? How do we understand it in the, the realm of microbiome and pre, you know, pre, you know, prebiotics and things like that? But you know, I think I think one of the ways I think about it is that. You know, when you look at grains, when you look at wheat flour, oat flour, corn flour, uh, those have uh, very low fiber contents, and even calling them whole grain doesn't make it a lot different. When I when I think about issues of like beans and legumes and things, now what I think about is that okay, so these have a three to one, you know, you know fiber, you know, carbohydrate to protein, and it's, it's heavily fiber. Uh, I think of beans and, and lentils as outstanding carbohydrate foods that happen to have some protein. People want to make them protein foods, uh, but they're kind of poor protein foods. It's hard to eat enough of, you know, quinoa or you know, red beans or black beans or or lentils to get enough protein, but they're absolutely outstanding carbohydrate foods. So now what we have is a carbohydrate fiber matrix. Uh, the fiber slows down the rate of digestion of the carbohydrates. Blood glucose appears much slower. Insulin's not stressed as much. And so, you know, the form of that. So, you know, a white bread versus beans uh, vastly different carbohydrates. One, the beans is pretty healthy form, and the white bread is a pretty unhealthy form. And when you're thinking about designing a diet, and when you were designing diets for studies, how did you, was there a certain percentage that came from refined versus a per certain percentage that came from what you call higher quality carbohydrates? So when we designed those studies, again, these were back in the early 2000s. So the Food Guide Pyramid was still the gold standard. So when we designed them, both diet groups got five servings of vegetables per day, exactly the same. Both groups got two to three servings of fruit per day. So we did exactly as the Food Guide Pyramid. The real difference was one group then got grains, and we tried to select whole grains as much as possible. We, we it, it wasn't all candy bars and sugar. It was, it was what the food guy pyramid would recommend you ate. So, you know, cereals and breads and things like that. Uh, and in the other diet, we replaced 50 grams of those carbohydrates with 50 grams more protein. And that was the effect. So in essence, we, we designed the high carb, low protein diet as absolutely best we could design it. We didn't we didn't set it up to fail. We didn't give it a whole bunch of sugar and and really, you know, lousy foods. We did it as good as we could do it. And you simply uh, swapped out an additional 50 grams of dietary carbohydrates exactly. for an additional so, so the whole diet was lower in carbohydrates. So again, these were weight loss studies. So both groups had a calorie restriction of 500 calories. And so in both groups, uh, you know, we restricted the carbohydrate and fat intake off the top. So, you know, it, it went down in both cases. And then for the treatments, we substituted out 50 grams of carb for 50 grams of protein. So the net, the net decrease in carbs in the, in the protein group was probably closer to 70 grams a day, uh, 70 or 80 grams from their baseline. But anyway, I, I mean, I think it's important to point out because everyone listening can simply do that. Yeah. If you guys do nothing yeah. else. And again, let's say you don't want to count calories, which by the way, I, I do think that you should have a baseline understanding of how many carbohydrates or how many calories that you are ingesting. 
But by simply translating what Don is saying, by reducing your carbohydrates and swapping it out for protein, there were significant, not just body composition effects, but there were also metabolic effects. Why do you think dietary protein has this influence in this way? What are some of the mechanistic ways in which perhaps the provider listening and then, um, you know, the, the lay public listening, why do you think that there is that impact? There's a lot of research has suggested that, you know, part of the issue of yo-yo dieting is loss of lean body mass. And so then your net ability to burn calories, that's your active tissue. Uh, and certainly muscles part of that. And if you lose active tissue as you lose weight, then your calorie balance has gotten lower. And so people will lose weight, they lose lean body mass. And again, depending on the rate of which you lose weight, if you do it with a low protein diet, somewhere between 35 and 50% of the weight you lose is coming from lean body mass. Uh, Starvation, for example, 50% of your weight loss will be lean body mass. And so that lowers your ability to burn calories. So a big part of it, Uh, is that we're looking for a protein-sparing effect. We want to protect muscle, both for functional mobility as you get older, but also because it burns calories, this whole metabolic issue. So so that's part of it. We also know that protein has a thermogenic effect. And so that, you know, when you increase your protein, particularly early in the day, it increases your, you know, thermogenic, your your ability or the fact that you burn calories, basically you waste it as heat. A lot of debate about where that comes from. If you read a freshman nutrition book, they'll say it's from digestion, absorption, and metabolism of protein, which kind of makes people think it has something to do with protein's harder to digest or absorb. And that's not really the case at all. We're pretty confident that the thermogenic effect is from the fact that meals trigger protein synthesis and muscle. And that is a very energetic, expensive exper- uh, process. And so we like to think of three meals a day to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. And that's where the energy expenditure comes from. And what we found with our weight loss studies is that Consuming the equal amount of calories in both diets as much as we could, the people on the higher protein diet lost about the equivalent of 300 calories a day more body fat. So basically, they're burning more calories while consuming the same amount of calories. That is fascinating. Do you think that one would see that if the distribution is different? What you did is you looked at a distribution of dietary protein, an equal distribution, I'm assuming. It was around 30 or so grams um, per meal in the higher protein group. It, again, you know, meal distribution, I think, is, is a confusing issue. I think the most important meal of the day to correct is breakfast. So I think that Uh, Just adding a lot more protein to a big dinner meal, I think, is pretty useless to do. Uh, And there have been experiments. Some of the Australian group sort of did that type of thing and didn't see much effect. I think the issue is when you come out of the overnight fast, the body's very sensitive to protein. It's also kind of sensitive to carbohydrate. So if you want to buy the insulin regulation theory, the worst of all worlds would be to have a high carbohydrate breakfast. So breakfast cereal with a banana and a glass of orange juice is probably a pre-diabetic diet. You know, if I was going to create diets that cause diabetes, that's how I'd start the day. No one is coming to your house for breakfast. (laughs) Um, Fascinating. Truly, truly interesting. Let me circle back and let me ask this question in a different way. When you have that first meal, and really what I'm getting at is this thermic effect of feeding or why or potentially how we could distribute protein that would increase thermogenesis. And again, I'm saying this loosely. Um, Would we see an additive effect if we hit enough protein between 30 and, you know, minimum of 30 grams to trigger the mechanics of skeletal muscle? Would we see an increase in the thermogenic effect 
because in the literature, you will see this thermic effect of feeding variable. It might be some data you might see 20%, some data you might see upwards of 25 to even 30. And it is, there are variations within the literature. And I would love for you to highlight as people are thinking, how can they leverage the food that they're ingesting and create a way of eating that provides even more utilization of calories, if at all? Yeah, I I think it's a great question. And I think, as you know, I always think in terms of mechanisms. If, I, if, if, yes, if I'm going to discuss something, I'm going to underpin it with a mechanism. And so the answer to your question is, what do you think the mechanism is? If you think it is something to do with digestion, absorption, and, and handling of nitrogen, then it doesn't matter when you digest the protein. However, if I'm right, and it has to do with triggering muscle protein synthesis, then moving protein to the first meal is critical. And I think that's the variation in the literature. If you see uh, some of the diets that have been used, uh, they're not paying attention to meal distribution. And I think if you group all of the protein in the last meal of the day, you'll minimize the thermogenic effect. And so maybe you only observe 10% maximum, where if you begin to distribute it differently, especially to the first meal, I think you can make it 20%. So, you know, I we've done some research that shows the ATP expenditure of that first meal, and I'm convinced that's the thermic effect. It's not digestion, absorption, and, and nitrogen metabolism. It's protein synthesis and muscle. Which is a very important point. It's, it's a very important point. And you guys, this is just to highlight that there is variations in the literature. Now, I, I want to make sure that we talk about, there's something else that you had mentioned that I'd love for you to elaborate on. And you said that a high fat diet would also cause insulin resistance. How? And, and so you can go into the literature and you can see uh, both human and animal models where people have fed high fat diets really high fat diets, 40, 50, 60% fat, uh, and they can show insulin resistance. But you always have to start your thinking about it as, is this a excess calorie diet? So is the body in a net storage issue? Um, a 60% fat diet, you know, a, a ketogenic type fat diet where people are eating less than their calorie balance probably won't have any negative effects. But if you're overeating calories, then whether you're eating carbs or fat, you're both of them are going to get you into trouble. And so you can see studies where they fed high fat and you'll get uh, increased uh, blood levels of triglycerides, increased free fatty acids. You'll get uh, increased things like ceramides and diacylglycerides, which will inhibit insulin sensitivity. Uh, there's no question that can happen. Uh, but you can do exactly the same thing overeating carbohydrates. And so back to my earlier point, what are people overeating the most? Well, 50% is coming from carbohydrates and 35 is coming from fat. You know, is it the bigger number or the littler number? You know, I think both are important. And as you know, I, I don't I don't go out and try and create high fat diets, you know, but I don't think there's anything wrong with a 35% fat diet or, you know, even up to a 40% fat diet, as long as the calories are in check. I, I would absolutely agree with you. And this brings me to something that I do want to bring up because I've had a lot of people send me uh, this study, and this is a study published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. And researchers looked at health data from 200,000 people from the Nurses Health Study, the Health Study 2, and Health Professionals Follow-Up Study in the U.S. Um, and what they found was that those who ate the most red meat had a 62% higher risk of developing the condition compared with those who ate the least. And I think that the condition that they were talking about was uh, type 2 diabetes. And in light of everything that we are talking about, it seems a bit counterintuitive that the idea of swapping out any kind of carbohydrate for some high quality protein would actually thus lead to a type 2 diabetes risks. I will say that this first came across my desk because it was published in The Guardian. 
Do you have any comments of this Harvard University study? Do you want me to trash? <laughs> By the way, you guys know, you guys I have to say, you have to understand, um, <laughs> I know these answers and what he is about to say, but it's important that you hear it because, again, the goal of this podcast is to have transparent conversations. And if we cannot have transparent conversations with world experts in a meaningful way, then what are we doing? Uh, and I'm going to kick the ball over to you, my friend. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's a Harvard study and they have published this multiple times. It's from the nurses study, which I think people need to understand is it's an interesting group that they have followed for a lot of years. But what's important to understand is it's a pro proprietary data set that nobody else can look at. So they basically can dream up answers and manipulate the data any way they want and, and publish results. And they've published this before. Uh, there's other groups that have looked at the same kind of data with the NHANES data, public data. And what they've actually shown is that red meat reduces the risk of diabetes. And so, you know, you have to sort of look at it. And first of all, the first thing that I, you and I've said before, and most people listening probably have heard, is that epidemiology proves nothing. Basically, it says, okay, here's something to look at. And so, you know, one of the things to realize is that if you do, uh, it, when you start looking at red meat, you have to think about, are you looking at people who have a healthy diet or an unhealthy diet? So if I take somebody who's overeating calories and I have them put a sausage pizza per day on top of an unhealthy diet, I guarantee you it's going to get more unhealthy. So was it the sausage in the pizza or was it the 1,200 calories from the cheese and the bread? I mean, it's an association issue and you have to look at it. The studies that you and I were talking about, you know, the three clinical studies that we did, and one of which was 12 months long with 130 subjects, these are random controlled trials. These are trials where we actually know what they're eating. We're monitoring it week by week, day by day. These aren't just sort of retrospective. I asked the nurse what she ate yesterday. These are controlled trials. And what's important about it is when we added in the protein, that 50 grams, we did it primarily with red meat. So substituting red meat into lower carbohydrates always, always improved pre-diabetic conditions and glycemic regulation. So if you look at that in the literature and actually controlled studies, what you'll see is it's always beneficial. So when the epidemiology and the pure science, the random controlled trials don't agree, then you have to start asking why. And the why is because the random, the, because the epidemiology is making vague associations that are hidden behind lifestyle, uh, how much fiber they eat, how many calories they eat, and they're not factoring it out. So again, you really have to look at those things. And when they continue to publish the same thing without ever doing random control trials to back it up, then you have to start looking for agendas. And I think most people would recognize, well, Willett has an agenda-driven individual. He's the author of the Eat Lancet that basically said you should eat more sugar than protein. Uh, I think there's some highly questionable science behind his thinking. Thank you to First Form for sponsoring this episode of the show. I get asked multiple times a day, what kind of protein powder do I like? And I have been recommending Formula One Natural for years. It is amazing. It is a premium sourced whey protein isolate. It tastes amazing and it mixes incredibly easy. Again, it is a low temperature processed cross flow micro filtered way. What does that mean? It means it is clean. It is very easy to absorb. It is very good for the health and wellness of your skeletal muscle mass. And by the way, once you hit needs of skeletal muscle, you have all these other amino acids that do very important things. And you can refer to the episode, but I will tell you, you have to get in your dietary protein intake. One way to do this is to head on over to firstform.com slash Dr. Lion, drop the natural formula one in your cart and you will get free 
U.S. shipping on orders over $75 or more. And also, uh, The Guardian. Is The Guardian a peer-reviewed journal, or is this a journal that uh, receives funding to publish certain medical research? There, yeah. So they're, they're definitely a magazine that is uh, reporting, you know, doing some sort of reporting, but they've clearly been funded uh, for by groups that are anti-cattle. So they've most notably published a lot of things related to Eat Lancet and also to environmental sustainability that are anti-cattle. Uh, and, it, you know, they've been funded to report that. So, you know, things that I think they've lost a lot of credibility, a, a, a magazine or a journal that I think had a reasonable uh credibility uh, has basically said, well, funding's important. You know, we have to stay in business. And they've kind of sold their soul, which is sad to see. Yeah. And I, I wanted to bring this up, you guys, because by the time we publish this episode, this has been circulating around. I've seen this circulate through The Guardian. I've seen it circulate through, I think that this was an NPR or Times Tech article. And the headlines talk about, they, they say this blanket statement, red meat eaters had a 62% higher risk of having the metabolic condition, the Guardian reported. And what they're talking about is type 2 diabetes risk. And um, what Don is pointing out is epidemiology data is data that is collected. This is typically... Um, I mean, 62% unto itself is just a stupid number. If you right. look at the paper, they say that one serving of red meat per week increases your risk by 46%. I mean, that's just a stupid number. I mean, 65% right. of the protein in the American diet comes from animal sources. That means every single person in the United States has type 2 diabetes. I mean, it's just a ridiculous statement. And we have to be able to at least provide some basic understanding. Now, on the flip side, that's not to say that a plant forward diet and that plants are bad. We are not having that conversation. I am just bringing up this headline because again, it seems as if every four months, the same conversation gets circulated, but it again, continues to be epidemiology. It does not uh, end up being randomized controlled trials where the data is available and can be evaluated and can be challenged and repeated. So that that I, mean, I, the, I thought was the bottom the bottom line to that is from 1975 till today the red meat consumption the beef consumption has gone down over 35 percent in the U S which is exactly when type two diabetes and obesity went up so we know the data is not in the same direction so when you go out and you say well this quartile who eats the most red meat is most likely to be diabetic well. That relates to the fact that they're overeating calories, the red meat's all coming from fast foods, they eat pizza five days to seven days a week. I mean, it's just, it's just a lifestyle dependent answer that makes no sense at all. And I appreciate you highlighting that because again, the goal is how do we get people healthier? And the only way that we're gonna be able to get people healthier is if we can provide information that makes sense, that there's a mechanism of action, and then there's a way to begin to think about it. For an individual- I, you know, Again, we're not, we're not in any way saying plant-based diets uh, aren't important. Fiber is very important. Phytochemicals are very important. Unfortunately, the average American gets 70% of their calories from plant-based foods now, and it's all pretty much crap. It's basically low fiber, ultra processed foods, uh, and we're getting no nutrition, just a lot of excess calories. Yeah, absolutely. Well, luckily we're shifting this conversation. My next question is something that has come up for individuals that are switching to increase more protein in their diet. How fast and what are some of the things I think from a mechanistic perspective need to be thought of as they're adapting? Is there an enzymatic adaptation? Talk to me a little bit about what we can just, as we project and thinking, uh, as we add in more protein into the diet. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question that people don't consider enough. Uh, so we talked about digestion absorption of protein a, a few minutes ago. 
uh, I think that one has to recognize that that process is, in fact, enzyme dependent. And so if you're on a really low protein diet, if you're only eating 60 grams of protein per day, and all of a sudden you want to go to 140, if you do that in one day, all of a sudden you're going to feel really bad. <laughs> uh, the body doesn't have the digestive enzymes. It may not have the uh, fat digestive enzymes that it requires. Uh, chances are you're going to feel bloated. You're probably going to uh, have gas issues. Uh, you're going to be constipated, et cetera, et cetera. So when we start counseling people, we try and get a sense of where they're currently at. If they're you know, eating a 90 grams of protein per day and they want to go to 120, fine, add it in. Probably, you know, I would certainly always look at their meal distribution. If you've got meals that contain 50, 60 grams of protein, you don't want to add another 50 to those. You want to put it in a different meal. And again, I've highlighted the first meal of the day, I think is the most critical. So I think those are important. But if you're on a low protein diet, you need to sort of ease into it. And what we've shown in various studies is it takes us a week to 10 days to really readapt for that problem. So, you know, if you're going from 60 grams of protein, you know, I'd go to 80, 85 for a few days, then to 100, then maybe to 120. So I would do it at steps over a seven to 10 day period. Otherwise, you know, what you're going to see is that the protein will draw fluids into the GI tract. Uh, the enzymes aren't there to digest it. Uh, you're just not going to feel good. So, uh, I, you know, I think that's a, an important thing that people, you know, where are you starting from and where are you trying to get to? Yeah, it is a good point. And for the listener, one of the things that we do in clinic is we often have patients take a digestive enzyme support. But again, um, it is a, an easy thing to do and titrating oneself up slowly. I'm also going to hold your feet to the fire because you said a very low protein diet at 60 grams. What is the average American, what does the average female have in terms of protein a day? So the average across all ages is around 70 grams for so females. Low. And, and it, it, it's on the low side. We know that around 40% of women over 60 are actually below the RDA. And, and we know that Vegetarians in general, worldwide, uh, the average is around low 60, 60 to 65, and vegans tend to be in the mid 50s. So, you know, they're getting down to the very low end and for the most part below the RDA. So we think those are really risky. It's, uh, you know, if you make that lifestyle choice, where do you get enough protein to stay healthy? And, you know, for a 25-year-old, that's one thing, but for a 45-year-old, that's a big risk. And it's not just a risk for muscle health. I mean, again, that is the foundation, but you need dietary protein for multiple other reasons. The body's always going through protein turnover. And uh, again, each of these individual amino acids have various roles in the body above and beyond skeletal muscle health. Would you agree with that? Yeah, totally. I was just reading a paper this morning that was, you know, recovery from stroke was heavily dependent on uh, aromatic amino acids. So the neurotransmitters, so phenylalanine, tyrosine, tryptophan, uh, if you have higher protein diets, your potential to recover from those kinds of things seems to be better. So, you know, we... And we just published a paper uh, in Journal of Nutrition, which basically argues uh, we need to move away from talking about protein uh, and talk about essential amino acids. We have nine essential amino acids, each with individual requirements, and we need to focus on them as nutrients. They're not some interchangeable part of protein. Uh, they're individual nutrients that we need to think about. And, you know, neurotransmitters or leucine and protein synthesis or threonine and gut health for mucin levels, uh, lysine and carnitine for fatty acid metabolism. There's just in, you know, all kinds of different issues that we need to directly address as nutrients and not just some vague issue of protein. Which 
brings us to the paper that he is describing, and I'm going to read you the title, and we'll link it here. And it's a per- it was in the Journal of Nutrition, August 2023, Perspective, Developing a Nutrient-Based Framework for Protein. And do you think that, you know, that is going to be the next frontier, is that we move away from thinking about protein as this generic recommendation, and then we begin to think about each of the nine essentials and maybe three of the more limiting essentials as individual nutrients as things that we can really target. And I am going to guess that it's going to circle all the way back to whole foods again as a primary standpoint of how we can improve our diet. Do you think that we will begin to identify, for example, things like lysine deficiency or and not overt deficiency, but again, you had mentioned the aromatic amino acids for for example, phenylalanine, do you think we will eventually begin to pinpoint um, perhaps inefficiencies of recovery or changes in, let's say, eyesight because of taurine, things that we have attributed to other vitamins and minerals? Do you think that we'll be able to circle back and bring it into those individual nutrients? Because The idea that each amino acid is an individual nutrient, I think, has been long overlooked from a health and wellness perspective. Yeah, I totally agree. The the reality is we haven't studied amino acids for their metabolic roles very well. Um, I'm trying to think of some examples, which way I want to sort of take the conversation. Uh, Let's let's use leucine for a minute. Um, If you look at the actual, well, well, let's step back one more step from that. If you look at uh, what we consider protein quality right now, PDCAS has an amino acid score. And if you add up the essential, the nine essential amino acids with that score, it only comes up to 23% of your protein requirement, which as we've already said, is really low. And so if you look in the human body, Essential amino acids make up over 50% of the amino acids in your body, but yet our requirement is only saying you need 23% of it. So there's a real disconnect. So if we, if we take an amino acid like leucine, the daily requirement for that is around 2.7 grams. And the argument is, well, that's related to nitrogen balance and things like that. But if you really think about the blood levels of that, uh, the blood levels that actually will support nitrogen balance are probably tenfold below what we would ever get to. But if we look at protein synthesis in muscle, what we know is it takes about three grams per meal. So instead of 2.7 grams per day, which is that minimum number that we're currently using for labeling and everything else, it's actually closer to seven and a half to nine grams per day. So there's this huge gap between what we're calling minimums. And that's true for whether we're talking about threonine or tryptophan or cysteine, methionine, all of those, we are not thinking about the metabolic outcomes. The the minimum to sustain nitrogen balance is a totally different answer than what's the optimum for metabolic regulation. And, you know, I think that is the next frontier. And The reason we published the paper in Journal Nutrition is as we hear this debate about a more plant-based diet, we need to shift from saying, well, all proteins are equal to understanding essential amino acid requirements. One one of the things I'd like people to understand is when you look at protein on a label, that's not protein. That's a nitrogen analysis. So they basically are doing a nitrogen analysis and then claiming it's protein. And basically, it could be anything. It could be nucleic acids. It could be urea. It could be some sort of nitrogen contaminant like melamine or something unhealthy. And they're claiming it's protein. And once they claim it's protein, then they multiply it by 6.25, which assumes that all amino acids have exactly 16% nitrogen. But that's not true. If you look at a non-essential amino acid, which is very prevalent in plant proteins, glycine, it's 32%. And if you look at methionine, amino acid, one of the essentials that are prevalent in animal proteins, it's 9%. And so basically the label is 100% meaningless in terms of what actually is there. 
And so we've need, we need to move beyond that. We treat, we treat vitamins as individual nutrients on the label. Why don't we treat amino acids as nutrients? A really important point. Event, how, how long do you think it will take for us to get there? For a long time, we've done, we've talked about protein because nitrogen was a analytical skill we had. We could chemically do that. And amino acids were very hard to measure. But now we have uh, GC mass specs with fluorescent detection, and we can do them in large quantity. So there's no excuse not for us to now identify essential amino acids. For, you know, back in the 70s, there was reasons. But now in, you know, 2020s, there's no reason we don't talk about it. You know, the analogy people have probably heard me say is, you know, talk about protein is like talking about a vitamin pill. We don't talk about the color or size or digestibility of the pill. We talk about the 14 vitamins inside of it. And protein is really nothing more than a food delivery system for essential amino acids. And it's time that we talk about essential amino acids as nutrients. I love that perspective. And I know that you are paving the way. Uh, I'm hoping it will eventually get out to the public, which I'm sure these scoring systems will. I have uh, one last question because- I'll just uh, add one more thing on that is that we're currently about to to add, we're currently about to submit another paper looking at what's called ounce equivalence. And if you go into the USDA and my plate, you'll see that there's ounce equivalence and it says one egg and is equal to one ounce of salmon or one ounce of chicken, but it says one tablespoon of peanut butter or a half ounce of almonds, and those aren't equivalent at all. And so again, as we think about plant-based diets, we need to come to grips with they're not actually equivalent. And so, you know, we're, we're looking at a paper that basically says, okay, you can make substitutions, but you also have to realize it's going to take more total protein and more total calories to be equal. And that's what the average consumer needs to understand. What would you say to someone who was concerned, and again, this is a little bit of a sidetrack, but it is something that has come up. What would you say to someone who was uh, discussing this methionine ratio, being concerned about skeletal muscle meat versus collagen? And is there data to support what that kind of blend would be? For you guys listening, collagen has a protein score of zero, while it is high in glycine and hydroxyproline, some of these other potentially also um, dye and tripeptides, there is some discussion that somehow balancing these um, other amino acid sources with muscle meat could be beneficial. Do you have any thoughts on that? So your question is about use of collagen? With the, my question is the ratio okay. between so, muscle so, meat and other forms of, of so. So amino acids. It's important to understand that our actual protein requirement has two parts. One is what we call the essential amino acids that we've already talked about, and the other is what we call non-specific nitrogen. Um, and you know, so if you have a diet that has seventy grams of high-quality protein in it, and you put in a really crappy protein like collagen as a source of non-specific nitrogen, that's probably fine. Uh, if you have a diet that has 60 grams of protein and it all comes from collagen, you're going to die in a few weeks <laughs> because it's totally deficient. So again, you have to think about how you use it. Uh, I think collagen is an awful protein and anybody spending money for it is wasting their time. Uh, so, uh, by the way, you guys, I, I don't agree. Benefit. I don't once agree. Again, <laughs> once again, you know, I look for mechanism. So, if you want to argue that collagen is good, then you have to come up with a mechanism. And I haven't seen any viable one. If you want to say glycine 
uh, has some effect on growth hormone. Okay, prove it. If you want to say it has an effect on arginine, okay, prove it. Uh, if you want to show me hydroxyproline, which it can never be used in protein, uh, actually has an effect, okay, prove it. Uh, so I'm open to it. I've heard a lot of testimonials about it, but based on any biochemistry I've ever done or seen, it's a crappy protein. <laughs> what? You heard it from him. What about in terms of skin and gut health? I know that people claim it, but I'm still looking for a mechanism. I'm a mechanism guy. Prove it to me. What does it do? You know, just throwing a bunch of collagen on, you know, I, I, I don't see a mechanism. And until I see a mechanism, it's just, it's, you know, it's a Ouija board issue. Um, and friends, this is how our conversations go. <laughs> On the daily, if I believe something, I'm going to have to now spend the next two hours looking at the literature. I anecdotally love collagen. I think collagen, while may not be a good source of dietary protein, I do think it does something for my hair and my skin. Again, but that is anecdotal. That topical or internal? Internal. And he'll say no way. But I'll have to get back to you on a, a mechanism with that. Take me the next uh couple hours. Don, is there anything she knows, else? She knows a risk. There's always a risk of asking me certain always. questions. Always. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Many, many years of this. Is there anything else that we should cover? Uh, there are other things, but we'll save this for a part two. Anything else that um, you feel is important based on some of the topics that we discussed, all of which are irrelevant, are relevant and um, for a more lay understanding, the book Forever Strong is written in a way where these concepts are put into play in a very actionable um, strategy. But is there anything else that you wanted to touch on? You know, I, I'm currently writing a review article on meal distribution. Uh, so that's definitely on my mind. And, you know, I think one of the things that people need to understand is that meal distribution is probably far more meaningful to adults than it is to kids. Uh, the whole concept of leucine stimulating protein synthesis is something that we know happens, but it seems to be particularly important in older adults. And by older adults, I mean non-growing individuals, so 35 and older. Uh, but it doesn't seem to be as meaningful to children or young adults. So, you know, I think you know, as a, as a lay person, as a mother out there thinking about, wow, I need to balance my kid's diet. In a Thank you to Inside Tracker for sponsoring this episode of the show. You know, based on this conversation with Don, it becomes imperative that you know your numbers, whether it is your triglycerides or your fasting glucose. These numbers are so important to age well. And that's why I love Inside Tracker. Inside Tracker makes it so easy for you to understand your metabolism and your muscle health. You can head on over to insidetracker.com, go to their store. You will save 20% off the entire Inside Tracker store just by using my code Dr. Lion. That's insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lion. I can't tell you something that is more valuable that we do in our clinical practice then measure blood work. And that includes ApoB, fasting insulin, fasting glucose. These markers are imperative and they're imperative for you to know so that you can execute on a plan. Head on over to insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lion for 20% off. Really for children, it's about protein per day. But as we get into adults and particularly older adults where they're under, you know, they don't need as many calories uh, per day, their diet needs to be much more specific. I think meal distribution becomes a much more important issue. And that first meal is critical. So again, that's kind of on my mind because I'm writing a review about it. I think it's, it's very confusing in the literature and part of the confusion is my fault because we published some of the first data on it. Uh, Definitely and we your fault. It, and, we, and we used an even distribution, which has sort of blown everybody's mind. But it's really all about the first meal and getting that corrected. So, And I'll, I'll mention that there are benefits to an even distribution, but not from the standpoint of what we're talking about. The benefits 
to an even distribution, maybe, of course, getting that first meal correct. The second meal it will help balance your blood sugar if calories are controlled, carbohydrates are managed. Getting in that dietary protein, especially for people that have been skewed toward 300 grams of dietary protein with much lower levels of carbohydrate, one could argue that an even distribution helps with number one, blood sugar regulation, number two, hunger control, and number three, really staying consistent, yeah. minimizing chaotic eating. Absolutely. So, you know, we, we started this whole conversation with issues of type 2 diabetes, and I don't think there's any question that using protein to reduce carbohydrates at each meal is a huge benefit. And, and the other one is, from a muscle standpoint, we have some pretty decent data that you probably maximize the muscle effect somewhere around 50 to 60 grams at a meal. So adding another 50 grams on top of a higher protein meal doesn't make it better. You'd be better off to add another meal or put it at a different meal. So we know that there's a low end of the threshold, kind of around 30 grams. We have less data, but we think there's an upper threshold somewhere around 55 grams. And so adding more protein should go in a different meal. Is there a max, do we know what the max number of uh, stimulation throughout the day would be? in terms of a benefit of 24-hour protein synthesis or 24-hour, I guess it would be, it wouldn't be nitrogen balance. It would be a 24-hour net protein synthesis. Yeah. I, you know, the, we don't really, I think the point I just made about there's probably a maximum benefit at an individual meal. So adding in another meal, uh, there's some really good data that adding a fourth meal late in the day before bedtime is beneficial for people trying to gain mass and strength. Uh, Luke Van Loon has done a lot of good data on that. So again, you know, I, I think that your target per meal sort of in a 30 to maybe 60 gram range, and then you s distribute it from there. So, you know, if you're a vegan, if you're a vegetarian, your first goal is getting a single meal that has 40, 45 grams of protein. And there's pretty good data about that. If you're not a vegetarian or vegan and you have 120 grams, then you should get at least two to three meals. And if you're trying to use 200 grams, probably you should go for four meals. I like that. And that's easy to do. Again, the, the first question is, what is your ultimate goal? And is it weight loss? Is it longevity? Is it hypertrophy or muscle building? And then the next potential question is, how are you getting your dietary protein? And that may direct the amount of meals and where you really need to focus your attention. And then almost really thinking about this metabolic correction. And Don and I will, uh, <laughs> the goal is to get this paper published, at least work on it and get that out there, a protein-centric perspective for uh, skeletal muscle metabolism and overall cardiometabolic health. Because when we look at what are the causes of mortality in for our population, at least for us here in the US, we have heart disease. I feel is a bit, you and I kind of go back and forth on that. Is it really heart disease? Uh, what happens when someone's heart stops? Do they write it down as heart disease or is it, you know, is it heart attack and does that get classified as heart disease? We have, um, uh, diabetes is also on there. Alzheimer's is on the list. Um, uh, cancer is also on the list. Many of these diseases have roots in metabolism and really metabolism and health of skeletal muscle, but is not directly spoken about. And I, I do think that that's important to mention. And that's it. Totally agree. <laughs> Dr. Donald Lehman, thank you so much for coming on. I am so excited to see you, even though we talk just about every day. This book, Forever Strong, was dedicated to you for a lifetime of mentorship and caring and really teaching me, and you continue to teach me. I'm so grateful to be able to bring you to the general public, because if not, uh, you may be sitting behind the computer and uh, doing other things, but not anymore, my friend. We are going to bring you to the masses, but I'm just so deeply grateful and I just love you so much. And you guys, if you like this episode, please take a moment to review it, 
to share the message. It is free of cost. The goal is to provide you with transparent conversations. And yes, I ran right into that because Don is extremely awkward if I tell him anything uh, touching or mushy. So I have spared you, Dr. Donald Lehman. You can thank me later. And (laughs) as always, I love you guys. Well, great fun to join you. Uh, I certainly appreciate and honored by the dedication. And, and you know, I cherish our, our friendship and interaction. So thank you. 